Hello everyone, good evening, good afternoon, uh, uh, good morning, depending on where you are. My name is uh, Darwin's Chamber. I'm a medical doctor from Zambia and I'm the president of the Association of East African Neurosurgeons. Um, we are happy to have this session of the neuro, uh, clinical neuroanatomy series that has been going on for the past uh, two to three months now. Uh, so today we are going to have uh, a presentation from SMART, but before we get into the presentation, we're going to have um, the panelists introduce themselves. So I'm going to start with uh, Dr. Naru, please. You can introduce yourself. Uh, thank you, da um, thank you, Darwin. I'm Dr. Naru uh, Bankole. Uh, I'm a consultant neurosurgeon, uh, trained uh, in WFN Rabat Training Center. Nice to join you again, guys. Thank you so much, Dr. Naru. It's uh, a great pleasure to have you here. Um, Public. Celeste. Hello, Celestine. You can introduce yourself. Thank you, Darwin. I am Celeste. I'm a CQA medical student at the Faculty of Medicine and Biomedical Sciences at the University of Yaoundé One in Cameroon. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much. Uh, then we have uh, Quado. I, I hope I've pronounced the name correctly. Yes. Sure, you can introduce yourself. From University of Ghana. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, next we have uh, Tunde, please you can introduce yourself. Um, hello everyone, good evening. My name is Tunde Olabatakia, 15th year student at the College of Medicine, University of Lagos. I'm happy to be here, thank you. Thank you so much, Tunde. Then we have um, Romeo. Have I uh, pronounced the name correctly? Okay, uh, we can have T up to introduce. Uh, uh, you can introduce yourself, please. All right. Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Tia Enea. I'm a fourth year medical student from Comes University of Health Sciences in Malawi. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Tia, uh, for being here. Uh, so at this time, I think I'm going to hand over to the presenter. Um, Smart, please, you can uh, go ahead. Let me enable uh, share screen so that you can share your screen and uh, begin the presentation. Okay, uh, greetings, everyone. Uh, my name is Oparugo Smart. Uh, I'm a medical student from the University of Portacourt, Nigeria. And um, today I'll be taking the spinal cord one. So, uh, our plan, uh, first of all, I'll be talking about the course anatomy of the spinal cord, the vertebral column, the ligaments. Then I'll get into the spiral on, on the spinal segments, enlargement and external features of the spinal cord. Then I'll talk, I'll talk also on the spinal meninges, then blood supply, clinical correlations, and then conclusions. Also, the objectives of today's lecture. So for by the end of this lecture, we'll be able to you know, discuss the anatomy of the vertebral column and spinal cord, understand uh, the clinical correlations of the spinal cord and vertebral column. Uh, am I loud or am I the Hello, am yeah, I at the can hear you. Yes, thank you, you sir. <clears throat> okay, so uh, as an introduction, I'll start with uh, what the vertebral column is all about. Uh, the vertebral column is a, uh, is a series of approximately 33 bones called the vertebrates. And these vertebrates are being separated by intervertebral disc. Uh, and they are generally grouped into five segments, which from the image, uh, you see the, the spinal cord, you see the, uh, the cervical, the thoracic, the lumbar, the sacral, and the procedural segments of the uh, vertebral column. Now, uh, what are the functions of these vertebral columns? Now, there are four major functions. Number one is protection. But the vertebral column itself encloses and protects the spinal cord within the spinal canal. Uh, number two, it acts as a support because it helps to carry the weight, uh, our weight around the pelvic. Now, its axis forms a central axis of the body, 
and when there is uh, uh, a if the alignment is not there again, we have other deformities. Then for movement, it plays a major role in our posture and our movements. Uh, I see my my slide very well. Is my slide visible? You know. Hello. Yeah, yeah, it's visible. Okay, sir. Okay, so uh, I'm talking on the structures of the vertebral column. Now let's use the uh, from the image from the image that we have here. Uh, we have the the uh, the uh, the part that is somehow like not like not circular is a ecliptic, like the moon. Uh, it's called the body. It's called the body, and is is found at the, the most anterior parts of the vertebrae. So it's its function is to bear the weight. And then we have the three, we can get like three process at the posterior parts. So we have the uh, the vertebral the vertebral arc. The vertebral arc. I don't know if you, if you can see the uh, the picture or the depiction there. The vertebral arc. We have the which now the vertebral arc itself uh, has several parts. We have the pendicle, the pendicle uh, connects the vertebral arc with the body. We have the the laminal and the laminal. We have three processes, which we have the lateral one. It's called the transverse process. Uh, process. We have the articular process. And then the spinous process that is found uh, most uh, like most posterior. That means if you run your hand through your, the mid of your back of your back, you probably get the spinal process. Then also have the vertebral foramen. That is the large uh, central opening in the vertebrae that which uh, the spinal cord itself runs through and it contains the, the spinal cord, the nerve roots, and the blood vessels. Also, okay. So, uh, this is a comparison of the uh, vertebrate of, of, the, of the vertebrates. So, from the from the cervical vertebrate, we found that it is smaller, and then there are seven in number. It has a triangular shape, and the transverse process contains the transverse foramen, which you will not find in other uh, vertebrates. Now, you know now the sp the spinous process itself. Sorry, the transverse is contains the transverse effort, whereas the uh, spinous process itself has a fork shape, more like it has a two end process, which you will not find in other vertebrates. So, but for the uh, thoracic vertebrates, it's larger in shape and it has a heart shape, it's a bit circular than the cervical, it's more triangular. Then it's the, the transverse process is long and contains particular forceps for the ribs. And then for the spinous process of the thoracic vertebrates, it's long compared to the cervical that is short and has a fork or two edge shape. Now for the lumbar, they are they are, they are kidney shape, they are larger, they have a kidney shape. And then we have they have a they flattened triangular, and then they have no facets of foramina and they're very thick compared to other ones. So from the from, from the uh, depiction, you could just see the differences. Okay, so this is just uh, this is I think this is a better description of <coughs> of the vertebrae of the vertebrates. Now we see the body, and then we see the arc. The arc contains the other parts. Now from the color, uh, if the one that is most posterior, at least the spinous process, we have the laminal, we have the pentacle, and then the transverse process, and then it's articular uh, forceps too. Okay, I'll be going to the ligaments of the vertebrates. Column. Now uh, the vertebrate column has uh, some ligaments. I'll just list them. We have the anterior longitudinal ligaments. This is the most anterior structure you find within uh, within the vertebrate uh, vertebrate column vertebrate column. We have the posterior. Um, if you watch, okay, let's use the diagram. Uh, the color the color red that is the one um uh, anterior is the anterior longitudinal ligaments. The one uh, behind the the uh the okay at the back at the bubble color is the posterior longitudinal ligament. Then we have other ones like the ligamentum um plevum. We have the interspinous ligaments, the supraspinous ligaments, and the 
inter transverse ligaments and also the last one that is the one found most posterior the knockout ligaments so this is also a depiction of it you can see the ligaments you have the anterior uh, that uh, the anterior is most anterior to the body of the vertebrate column then behind the body like around the vertebral canal we have the posterior transverse ligaments and then between the um the transverse process we have the inter transverse ligaments then we have between the articular forceps, we have the facet capsular ligaments. We have also the supraspinous ligam uh, ligaments. So, um, are we following? Am I too fast? Sorry. Are we following? Hello? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. Okay. 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 Thank you very much. Okay. The next one is the spinal cord. Um. Uh, okay. The spinal cord is a uh, part of the uh, central nervous system. As we know, we have the brain and the spinal cord as the main branches of the, spine, of the CNS. So the spinal cord, as we know, is just a continuation of the uh, the brain. What passes the uh, foramen magnum, it turns the spinal cord and extends. So it's it's one of the uh, the parts of the CNS, and it's found within the vertebral canal of the vertebral column. So if we look very well, the spinal cord runs through the vertebrates inside or uh, through the vertebral canal of the vertebral column. Okay. Uh, so this is a this is the segment of the spinal cord as seen in a cadaver on a, on a, on a cadaveric the uh, specimen. Now we could just see uh by segments we have the lumbar spinal cord, we have the dramatas, we have the um the sacral spinal cord. And then segments L5, S1, this is a segment. So, so this is like, like the fifth lumbar segment, the first sacral segment, and so on. Now, if you look very down, you will see the uh the pia mater and or that is the coverings of, of the dramata or of the meninges of the vertebral column. Okay, uh, the next thing I'll be talking about is the extent of vertebral column. Uh the the so the vertebral the, the spinal cord uh it extends is actually called the S is the continuation of the the uh, brain stem of the brain stem so it extends from the uh, foramen magnum of the base of the brain to l1 l2 vertebrates where it's terminated as the conus of uh, medullaris. Uh, so, in summation of okay, in summary, the spinal cord extends from the uh, brain stem that is from medulla oblongata down to L1, L2, or the lumbar the second lumbar vertebrates. Uh, where after that, it now turns to the conus medullaris. Then, from there, we have a tiny thread called the uh, phylum terminal. Which extends the tip of the conus, which extends from the tip of the conus medullaris, where the vertebrate, where the spinal cord ends, up to the first procedural vertebrate. Now, let's talk about this: the segments of the vertebrate of the vertebrate. We have, uh, we have five segments. That is cervical segment, uh, cervical seg uh, segments, which is from C1 to C7. That is the seven uh, cervical vertebrates. We have the thoracic. And um, there are 12 from T1 to C12. We have the lumbar, there are five from L1 to L5. We have the sacral that is from S1 to S5. And they are fused. The procedure is from uh, one to three or five. And they're also fused. Now, from the description, now the green part uh, shows the seven cervical vertebrates. The red color part shows the 12 cervical, that's a thoracic vertebrates. The yellow color shows the five lumbar vertebrate and the five and the blue color shows the fifth sacral vertebrate now that's about the sacral extensions and uh, enlargements um now they are in in the, in the spinal cord two regions are enlarged and the reason is because to enable them accommodate a larger number of uh, nerve cells and then to communicate uh, informations to the upper and lower limb now these extensions include 
the cervical enlargement. This cervical enlargement, they are spinal cord exten uh, extensions that correspond to the arm. And you can find them from uh, C5, that is the fifth cervical, to C1. So these are mostly the, uh, so, um, the spinal nerves from S5 to C1. Whereas the lumbar enlargement, uh, they correspond to the legs and they're called the lumbar enlargement. Whereas the other one is called the cervical enlargement. So you have the, the lumbar enlargement and they correspond to L2 to S3. So if you have from the image, you could find the, after the, after the medulla oblongata, you find the cervical enlargement, which extends from C5 to C1. Then the spinal cord maintains its structures. And at the lower part, we have the lumbar enlargement, which corresponds to, from the spinal segment of L2 to S3. So this picture shows uh, the development of this spinal cord. As we can see, for the first trimester, uh, you see the lumbar segment, this uh, sacral and fourth segments. Then the next one, start, uh, the shapes start changing from a linear to a more slant and to a more S N shape uh, in, in adults. And then if it works very well, the spinal cord in the first trimester extends to the procedural vertebrates. But in later development, it's, it extends, it goes upper, like an upper segment towards the sacral segment. And in adulthood, it gets to, it ends at the L1, L2, where it ends at the conus medullaris. And then an extension, or a trade-like extension, would not continue downwards. So the next on our list is the spinal meninges. Now, generally, meninges are coverings of the uh, CNS. So we have the brain meninges, we have the spinal meninges, but they all take different, uh, the same form and arrangement. You have the dura matter, the arachnoid matter, and the pier matter. Uh, the same in, uh, as having brain. In the spinal cord, we have the same arrangement. So these uh, meninges or spinal meninges, they contain this uh, cerebrospinal fluid, they send, uh, the CSF, which helps to support and protect the spinal cord. And they are also the, okay, or they're the same with the cranial meninges. Now, if you have a very good look at the image that we have there, now we have the first covering that is less, less okay, um, there are two images there. We have, let's the one, the small one, inferior, we have the three meninges, the arachnoid, the, that is, that is light pink, we have the darker pink, that is arachnoid matter, that is the one found in between, and the pier matter that is very closely attached to the spinal cord. So uh, the bigger picture, we have the, uh, the darker shade, the darker ash color as the dura matter. Now in between, we have the arachnoid matter and then the pier matter, which is very, very close to the spinal cord and the rootlets of the spinal nerves. Um, the next uh, on our list is the blood supply of spinal cord. Now the spinal cord is also rich, is, is richly in, uh, supplied with blood. Uh, they are mostly supplied by branches of the vertebral and uh, segmental arteries. Now the vertebral arteries gives rise to the anterior and posterior spinal artery. Now, if if you look from the image there, uh, we will see we will see the vert the vertebral artery. The vertebral artery, which you know is one of the arteries for is a branch of basal uh, the basal artery that goes to the head. Now it gives the anterior and posterior spinal artery. And then we have the segmental arteries, which includes the deep cervical artery, the central cervical artery, the posterior intercostal artery. All, all these give rise to that one pair of radical artery branches, which supplies the roots of the spinal nerves. Now, this is a cadaveric uh, depiction of the spinal cord and its arteries. Uh, so if, if you look very well, you could see some of the, you know, uh, the blood supplies to this arteries. Oh, sorry, I can't, uh, I'll be uh, able to uh, use the abbreviations one by one. Okay, so for the, ve so for the venous drainage, we have the anterior and posterior uh, spinal veins, and they drain into the, uh, the radical veins, which then drains into other than the internal and external vertebral venous places. Okay, so, um, Hello, oh, hi. Uh, are we flowing? Oh, my yes, we are. 
Yes, we have. Thank you very much. Uh, so we'll be going through the the clinical correlations of spinal cord and vertebral column. Uh, the first on our list is lumbar puncture. Uh, lumbar puncture is a procedure that is often performed in emergency departments to get uh, a CSF fluid. And this fluid, maybe the uh, a doctor might request for this fluid when they suspect meningitis, suspect uh, subarachnoid hemorrhage, as as a head, uh, there is a need to look out for things like um, nervous system diseases such as the Gablina Barrow syndrome or Castimatous meningitis. Or sometimes they can just be used as a therapeutic relief for pseudotumor um, cerebrosoma. And then also can be used maybe when you want to uh, give antibiotics or spinal anesthesia, which is very common in um, these surgeries, maybe like in CS and other uh, surgeries that deals with the lower uh, limbs or lower part of the abdomen or limbs. Now the next, okay, now for the uh, lumbar puncture, first of all, uh, the patient, uh, you get the concept, then you have to swab or try to uh, at, uh, like apply anesthetics around the region, then you now use a local anesthesia and anesthetic agent to anesthetize the skin. And then it can be okay. Then you now assess the subarachnoid space. So you have to, with your hand or your thumb, you have to look for the L2, L3, or between the L3, L4, or that is the intervertebral disc. And then you now perform your manotomy, oh, uh, sorry, manometry. And then you put the needle, uh, the the needle, the needle. And then you collect at least 10 drops of the, CA, of the, of the CSF, you know, uh, into four different test tubes. And then you apply a sterile dressing as a puncture. Your patient will sit, will be placed in a spinal position. And then, and then you now draw, uh, then it draws the sexual glucose to compare the uh, CSF glucose. Okay, so uh, the next, uh, the next thing anatomy there is the, the Tussle's line is a horizontal line that connects the highest points of the iliac crest, which is an important marker to determine the puncture level. In adults, this line lies between the uh, L4, L5. So if your patient is if your patient is uh, sitting down, and then you have uh, your your patient uh, is okay, uh, about to sit down, and then try to flex the the trunk, the long the the iliac crest of the hip bone corresponds to the L, to L4. So that line is called the Tuffel's line. So that is a demonstration of the first line. So when the patients, maybe like, uh, I know I've seen it being done, like if you, if you ask them like, like to sit resting down, maybe like hug a small pillow and then flex their back, their back. When you now look at the iliac crest, that's the line there corresponds to or uh, the about between the L3 and L4. That is actually where a uh, lumbar puncture is really given. I think that is okay. Uh, so you have uh, epidural anesthesia. Now it involves a uh, introduction of local anesthesia into the epidural space. Uh, is actually done through catalyzation and it's mostly can provide it can provide repeats Administration of infusion of anesthesia anesthetic agents. Now you you put your, you like you get your uh, anesthetic agents and you and you put them or introduce them into the um, epidural space. And is this procedure is very common with uh, most surgeries. For example, I know like uh, doing so like this is just how it's been done. How it's been done. I don't know, maybe like doing uh doing uh, sessions is very common uh, in this area or like in Nigeria doing um session or prostate surgeries. Okay, um so so that so that now uh, I think from this uh, image, if if you could trace the iliac crest, that line you know corresponds to the first line and is the point where uh, most epidural and is given is given. 
So the next on our list is the spinal cord injury, or SCI. It's an insult to the spinal cord, maybe which can result into a change, maybe temporary, uh, temporary or permanent change in the cause normal motor, sensory, and autonomic uh, functions. So patients with spinal cord injuries usually have either permanent or often neurological defects or disabilities. So any injury or anything or, or any insult or assault to the spinal cord will lead to spinal cord injury. Uh, now, spinal cord injury, according to the, Af the American Spinal Injury Association, the uh, ASIA, uh, they classify it in five categories. So we have the complete spinal cord injury where we have no sensory or motor functions uh, in preserved, like it's preserved in the uh, sacral segments. You know, we find that mostly in obvious gas, uh, obvious accidents, like example, a gas motor accident, or maybe fall from a tree or a height or, an, or any fatal injury. Now we have the incomplete spinal cord injury. In this part, the sensory, but not the motor function is preserved below the logical level and can extend to the sacral segment of S S5. We have the C type called the incomplete one. In this one, the motor functions is preserved below the logical levels. And most key muscles below the logical levels have muscle grades uh, less than three. Okay, we'll talk about, we'll talk about muscle grades later on. Uh, we have the incomplete, the, the incomplete ones. This one, the motor function is preserved below the neurologic level. And then most of the key muscles below this level have a muscle grade that is greater or equal to three. We have the normal spinal cord injury. In this one, uh, the sensory and motor functions are usually normal. So this is the uh, ASIA uh, implement scale. So we have the E for uh, E that is complete. There is no motor, there is no sensory, and there is no sacral spare. So everything is damaged. We have the complete, we have the incomplete one. There is, there is no motor session, but there's a sensory below the logical level. We have the incomplete. We have 50% of the muscles are less than grade three. But for incomplete, uh, part uh, as the D, uh, they are more than, sorry, for C, they are less than three and more than three in D. But then for the normal, both sensory and motor functions are normal. So let's talk about the MROC scale in the logic assessment. The assessment of uh, muscle, of muscle power is a key part of the logical examination of the upper or lower limb. As a result, it is important to uh, maybe get ourselves familiarized with the Medical Research Council scale as the MROC on muscle power. So the MROC scale of muscle strength uses a scale of one to, one to, uh, zero to five to scale the power of particular muscle groups in relation to the movement of a single joint. So we have score one, that is no contraction. We have one, flicker or trace of contraction. Two, there's an active movement with gravity emitted. Three, there's active movement against gravity. Four, active movement against gravity and resistance. And then five is a normal uh, power. So you think that a doing uh, C of, of incomplete spinal injury, we have most, uh, um, less than three, whereas in incomplete D, we have greater than three, whereas in five, in the, uh, the last one, all are normal. So let's move on to uh, spondyli uh, spondylysis. spondylysis. Uh, it's, it refers to the generation change in the spinal or the bones uh, most times, generative intervertebral disc between the vertebrates. In spondylysis, there is change in the spinal cord and it can be due to osteoarthritis. And it occurs in the neck or like it can be in the neck, the thoracic spine or the lumbar spine. Uh, so that's what we have a spondyl spondylolithiasis. Uh, it occurs when two vertebrates slide forward over the vertebrate below it. So we have several types. We have the congenital, ischemic, and generative spondylolisthosis. Uh, so okay, from the uh, from the image, you can find uh, you can see that there's an uh, an injured vertebrate, and then we have a broken pieces. That broken pieces is usually uh, the spinous process. And then there's this forward slide of the spine. 
of the spine. Then you will see how the patients will look like they are bent you know, forward and they don't have a straight. Um, then look at uh, it's, uh, the normal S-shape uh, spine. So they have a type of, uh, so uh, this one is uh, the sclerosis. Sclerosis, we have the, no the health sclerosis, this is normal. We have the uh, thoracic um, sclerosis, we have the lumbar, the lumbar, uh, trachoma and the combined sclerosis. So this is just how it looks like. They have this S-shape uh, structures. Uh, I think that is the end of my lecture. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you very much. So that is the end of lectures on Spinal Cord One. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Smart, for your brilliant presentation. It was well, uh, well furnished. Uh, you had a good delivery. You gave a lot of uh, clinical applications. So actually, at this point in time, we'd like to take uh, any comments or additions or or questions from the panelists. Uh, okay, uh, Dr. Nuru, please. Okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, dear colleague, dear young colleagues, and uh, thank uh, Smart uh, Shidi for your brilliant presentation. My, uh, I would like just to address to just a few comments that might uh, be uh, helpful for, 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 for all of them. Um, all of us, um, when you talk about spinal cord, okay, I, I appreciate the way that you, you do your describe, uh, you describe your anatomy, okay? Uh, it's not bad, it is, uh, you, you do that uh, assistantly because you know it is so long anatomy. So you try, your, you do your best to summarize things. Uh, but I don't know if you talk about the fixity means, uh, maybe I, I, I lost that, but however, uh, you should talk about the fixity means of spinal cord. When you come to the correl clinical correlation, uh, I would like to uh, to highlight here that the clinical correl the most clinical correlation about the spinal cord it is a spinal cord compression. Okay, this spinal cord compression might be traumatic or non-traumatic. Non-traumatic means it's not about the injury uh, after trauma. Okay, it might be. Uh, you know, uh, about the tumors, vascular disease, and inflammatory disease, okay? And also, um, you, you focus on lumbar puncture, but you know that uh, it is very difficult. You should uh, try to, uh, how can I say that? You should try to know, to, to difference, uh, to be sure that you don't have a spinal cord compression before to do a, puncture, a lumbar puncture. I don't know if you get my point. So I would like you to, 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 orient, to orient your clinical correlation regarding a spinal cord compression, which is an emergency, a diagnosis emergency and therapeutic emergency, okay? And then, yes, but as you say, you say that the, the spinal cord, the spinal cord uh, ending with the film at the level of L2, in most of our normal anatomic uh, variety could be T, uh, T12 to L2, okay? The spinal cord will end and then we'll continue with uh, the film uh, with, uh, with the, the uh, how can I say that? Um, the, kina, the, the, the kina coda, uh, you know, nerves and, 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 and as well. So please don't do uh, lumbar puncture uh, without to be sure that you have a spinal cord compression, and that is come is uh, is uh, is uh, and the etiology the, the um, you know the etiology the most etiology might be you know a nervous uh, central system uh, uh, pathology. So be at pay at uh, pay attention about that, and uh, that's I think uh, that is what I can tell to you. And also, it is good what you do. The Asia classification it is uh, it is welcome in, in this topic, and um, uh, also try to define uh, spinal cord injury uh, and sp and other spinal cord compression, which it's not traumatic. Okay, and how you can diagnose that also in imagery. Okay, in MRI when you have uh, extradural uh, 
uh, which co which compress the spinal cord how you can define how you can you can you can define you can um, uh, retain the diagnosis and when it is intradural but not extra and not intramedullary how you can also uh, um, retain the diagnosis and when it is intramedullary how you can diagnose that okay I think that I think that is uh, briefly that is what I can add, and I don't know. It is very interesting topics, but it is anatomical also. And uh, congratulations of uh, what you do. Just to be specific, that you should pay attention about the lumbar puncture in uh, and uh, to your clinical correlation should be the spinal cord compression and how to diagnose that uh, clinically and how to diagnose that also on imagery. And to be aware that you have spinal cord compression, uh, uh, which can be traumatic or non-traumatic, and then can list some 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 etiology of them. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Noor, for these very very important uh, comments. Uh, Smart, if uh, maybe you have something to say, uh, you can you can go on. Oh, I've got a question. Oh, I've got a All question. Right, so, oh, okay. Oh, before before Smart comes in, I've got a question. To yeah, uh, my my question uh, is on um, spinal injury. Yeah, for, for spinal injury, like for the cases that I've seen, uh, like most 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 probably here in Zambia, most of the patients that I've seen and the prognosis for most of these patients, it's like really poor because. Uh, most of uh, the neurosurgeons are based on in the central or central part of them, like in the capital city. So the the hospitals that are in the peripheries don't have neurosurgeons. So most of the times these um, patients are managed by orthopedic surgeons. Most of the time, sometimes even by general surgeons. When maybe someone sustains an RTA, then when uh, maybe due to an RTA they get a spinal injury. So now. Uh, on the management of spinal injury, how best can you help these patients to maybe preserve their their, their nerves? Seeing that um, neurons are cells that do not uh, regenerate like these other cells, yeah. So, but like, how best can you um, manage these patients? Like, for example, for us who are you might be interns, yeah. When you receive these patients in the emergency room, um, yeah. Like, how best can you preserve their their nerves? Yeah, and the second question is, is it something that you can maybe restore the patient's um, um, like uh, sensations, I would say? Yeah, can the, can the nerves start working properly? Maybe is, is that maybe some more management that you can do to, to, uh, to, to heal these patients and help them out? Yeah, I don't know if it's clear. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Poster, for your question. I, I think your, your question is quite clear. Um, I think it's Dr. Nuri's best place to answer this one. Smart um, may not have the, the practice, uh, the adequate um, response for it now. Uh, Dr. Nuru um, is asking for the management principles, if I got him well, the management principles of a spinal cord injury. And uh, like we've seen the ACI classification, which Smart presented, is someone, can someone recover completely? Even if you will say at Asia B or Asia A, thank you. Okay, thank you very much, uh, um, Celestine. I, of course, you know uh, the damage of a spinal cord uh, is uh, is devastated. You know, uh, it's the uh, uh, Asia A and uh, B. It is it, the pronostic. It is very worst. You know less than 20, uh, I don't know, less than 30% of patients will recover because uh, uh, it is, when it is damaged, it is damaged. It is not easy to recover. What we have to do it is to try to uh, to do a, uh, how can I say, a high uh, re rehabilitation for the patient, you know. And also, uh, why, why, uh, why this can be happen? Maybe as you explained, uh the the management uh, the, the delay between you know between the trauma the injury and the management might be uh, long but we all, all of them we know 
all of us, we know now that uh, um, uh, quickly you take care about the spinal cord injury, you know, most uh, um, um, better it is, is, the, is, is the outcome. But to be honest, when you have uh, at the beginning of, of the, of the present, clinical presentation, ASIA A and ASIA B, explain to the patient that the chance to recovery is very, very low. You cannot do a miracle, okay? You cannot do a miracle. But when you still have a sensibility, you, uh, you know, it's not, it, 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 it is not going all, it is not going on at all. You still have some sensibility, you still have some, some, some motricity. Yeah, we can, you can do something to decompress and try to, to stabilize. Because in the injury, the goal is to stabilize, you know, the spinal cord to the spine, okay, to don't compromise the stability that might be, uh, you know, um, devastated of, of the spinal cord. And the second one, it is to, to have a functional, you know, improvement also. So um, when you have a worst uh, uh, Asia as uh, you know, the first present, a clinical presentation, uh, don't expect it to have, uh, uh, you know, a good outcome. No, no. And uh, at least you should try to treat a spinal cord injury within, you know, the six hours. Because after six hours, uh, also, uh, you might, uh, you might, uh, the, the outcome must go in, you know, worse. So quickly you take care about that. Better is this. But in our, in our, in our country, I, I am agree with you. People will do their injury and they will take, uh, they will be managed that maybe after 24 hours, but it is too late, you know, it's too late and four hours, 48 hours. So um, that is, that, that, that is uh, uh, a big, a big, a big problem for us in, 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 in our country, in Africa. Yeah. Yes, uh, yeah, you can go ahead. Thank you. I don't know if I answer your question or if you, you you need another, I don't know, maybe, I don't, I, I hope I answer your question, um, Pastor. Uh, yes, you have, Doc, you have. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Okay, Smart, I see you, you raised your hand. Go on. Yes, greetings. Okay, uh, uh, do you know one of my internships, uh, was that in neuroscience uh, hospital, I think they are managing all this stroke and spinal cord injury. But I noticed that most times they just fall back to uh, doing physiotherapy most times for, you know, their management. So I uh, think, so was it just like just to increase the, these, uh, the muscle strength, like the, the MRC or, well, I don't think I'm like this. I think even also here in Nigeria too, I don't think there's much management for people that have, um, spinal cord injuries was for was doing was staying there for a very long time i think for like six months i think those, i think most times just recommend them after treatment and management they just recommend them back to uh to therapy most times so like i don't really get the you know since and okay as uh the first person asked that since it was more of like nerve cells and if nerve cells cannot really regenerate so why like is therapy actually like kind of like a way to like increase the density of the nerves or make them regenerate or something. Uh, that's what I'm uh, yes, I'm uh, smart. I, I I think I got your your question. Um, I won't really say that there's not uh, much management. As you heard, Doctor Nuru clearly said the goal of management is to stabilize the spinal cord, and that when the prognosis doesn't present well, like when you're already in Asia B or Asia A. You can't really expect a, a miracle per se to happen. Then I understand your point too of saying that the neurons do not regenerate, but um, I think physiotherapy is just there to kind of re-educate whatever is left if it can still uh, function uh, as much as possible. I don't know whether Dr. Nuru can add something on this. Like, What is the main goal of physiotherapy? Yeah, I am totally agree, um, completely agree with you, Celestine. Yeah, that is, uh, that is correct what you said. Physiotherapy, it is, uh, it is very a, a big part of the deal to, to, uh, to the outcome of the patient, you know, but uh, also there also, you know, you don't have miracle, you know, so yeah, it is, uh, it is uh, 
uh, it is uh, physiotherapy um, take a lot of place in the management. Nowadays, you cannot uh, manage a spinal cord injury and, and, and without uh, physiotherapy. It is a joke. So I am agree with you, uh, Sebastian. Yeah. Okay. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you very much. I think uh, I, I got the answer. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much, everyone, for this, uh, for being present already for participating in this uh, wonderful presentation by SMART on the spinal cord section one. Uh, there will be a next section. Probably they'll go into more details to talk about the white matter, the gray matter, to talk about the ascending and descending tracts of the spinal cord. Thank you so much for everyone for your contribution. Thank you so much for Dr. Nuru for being here for all he's added uh, for us to better understand this presentation and have a wonderful weekend. Thank you. Thank you.